Um, the first thing that I really want to just start off is kind of like a recap on uh, some of the things that we talked about last week, and I want to um, see first if there's um, any questions, and I want to, you know, if there are not any questions, I just want to recap the law of appetite first uh, after we field for any questions. So if anybody on the phone or anybody in here has any thoughts or questions, please throw them out pertaining to what we uh, talked about last week or anything else that has transpired in your life or something you saw. Um, any questions on anything? <clears throat> you know, I, I have, um, I don't know if it's, it's going to lead into a question, but I have something that um, I noticed this week um, that I wanted to share. Okay. Uh, watching a TV show, a reality TV show on a on Sunday, I think, and I usually, I, I watch with a different purpose um, to do it, but I noticed that this particular Sunday, there was a situation where this one woman just could not, she cannot let go of something that someone else did to her, and every time she meets up with this chick, she is like going at her, going on, and afterwards, I felt like, I felt so heavy and so burdened, it would just bother me. I didn't even focus on that, but I was driving down the street, and I was like, why has my attitude all of a sudden changed? And it, I just felt like, all of a sudden it was like, it's the vibration. Forgiveness is a lower, vi I mean, an unforgiveness is a lower vibration than forgiveness. And I'm starting to see now and make a difference that it is important what you allow into your, your space, because it can actually change your attitude. Is that right? Is that the, is that the case? It just seemed like there was a whole shift and it took me a while to realize what it was and I do believe it was that. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you basically, you, you answer your question through, through what happened, you know? Um, behind our skin, all we are is like a super absorbent material. And we're an amplifier of whatever we absorb. And so a lot of times the things that we witness in life or interact with or, or view, those things are directly um, absorbed by us. And then later we feel them amplified when we feel a shift in our feelings, you know? So that, that sometimes happens uh, when we're just not, you know, how you, we kind of watch TV haphazardly, you know? And then when we watch TV haphazardly, um, that night you have you dream about a particular character that's just because we absorb the imagery and the, and the energy of it um, right. also with unforgiveness unforgiveness is of a lower vibration but the other thing about unforgiveness is that it supercharges it supercharges the, the soul in a sense um, that's why unforgiveness is so contagious because it actually gives you a, a very, it gives you a very strong sense of power because you can control how you feel by harnessing uh, the hatred or the sadness or the bitterness or the confusion. And it can make you feel powerful. And that's why, um, that's why it is that people can come in and really kind of um, bounce a lot of energy off of each other when they're talking about things they hate about a situation or a person because it actually gives you a, a sense of strength. But it's what I call um, credit card strength in that you can get a lot off of a credit card initially and you can gain a lot of things, you know, and a lot of uh, possessions, but what you have to pay back outweighs right. what you uh, gain through spending on that credit card. So unforgiveness is exactly that same way. And the way that um, we feel the payback with the unforgiveness is after periods of time when we hold that in, it destabilizes our, our, our ability to be at peace. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times when, we, uh, we, when we're in an unforgiving state, concerning something, then something else unrelated will happen, but that that living entity of unforgiveness will cause us to be completely unraveled by the other situation because it makes us like fragile over time. And that's the interest. You know what I mean? 
But in the case of in the case of um, you seeing it, you basically absorbed it, and it was something that will give you an opportunity to just be mindful of what you're watching. Because when you're mindful, you can um, basically create a, uh, a sifter of energy around yourself so that even when you see something, you don't absorb it all into yourself. Well, I thought that's one of the main reasons at one time why I could watch it, because I could see it as being something that I could yourself you you talked about um, the shows where black women have the contention between each other right your prayer should be directed in yourself to change your relationship with black women mm -hmm. you feel me because when you change that amongst in your relationships and I'm not saying you know I'm not of course you know I'm not saying okay you're fighting all every right. black woman you see you know what I mean mm -hmm. but if you alter the way you are relating with black women, you will you'll actually be fulfilling your prayer. And the other thing that I wanted to get on to touch on this just for a quick second is the reason you felt that way is because the scene, the camera angles, the people selected for that show, and the entire way that it was set up was designed to make you feel that way. And I'm going to give you an example. Um... Did you see the movie Precious? No. Okay, don't go see it. I, did, I couldn't break because of what I heard about it. I just felt like it just wasn't those, one of those things I could. Right, then don't go see it, don't go see it. Did you see For Colored Girls? I did. Okay, now, <laughs> it's the same movie. But my point is that a big part of those movies, right, they are designed in such a way to put images or reinforce uh, realities or thoughts or images of depression or hurt or division inside of people, and particularly towards the audience that they're being geared towards, which is black women. You, you see what I'm saying? So yeah, when, but I got a different vibe from for colored women. Yeah, you did. Yeah. You feel but what I'm I saying? Saw where it was, I saw accountability. Uh -huh. I saw where people had to take a look and say, hey, I'm not in this situation because necessarily because someone did me wrong. A lot of the choices I made led me to this point where I'm at. Right. So I saw it from a different vibe. Right, right. Now you you saw it from that vibe, right? But what I'm what I'm dealing with when I'm talking about that is not anyone in this room or on the phone who's listening to what I'm saying. I'm dealing with how it affects people in general. And, and, and what I'm saying with that is that those movies, just like any other movie, a lot of them are designed to create um, an industry for division. You, you understand what I'm saying? And so when you feel like that, it's designed that way. And it's a, a trigger to kind of give us um, opportunities to see where we need to bring um, wholeness into our lives concerning our interactions, you know? Right. Yeah. So I did want to say that because movies are very powerful because they have the ability to implant thoughts in your head concerning even experience that you have never had. That's why children are afraid of monsters. They're only afraid because those images have been planted in their head uh, via TV, via you know horror stories and things like that. Otherwise, it wouldn't have space to live in them, you know? Okay. Yeah. 
So good, good question, good thought. I would like that you put that out there. Uh, any other thoughts or questions from anybody? If not, I'm going to skip that along to um, recap on last week. So the first thing I want to just go back over right quick is um, we dealt with a concept called the law of appetite. And we dealt with that in conjunction with us talking about um, soul mating, or in the title of the uh, these talks is called the art and science of soul mating. And let me just recap a little bit before we get on the law of appetites. Um, the reason that I really wanted to begin to enter this into our mind as discussion with the art of soul mating and the science of soul mating is because the single purpose we come into this earth is to find love. We come into this earth to become love and to experience being loved. That is it. Everything else that we do is basically a commentary on that, to the jobs we do, to the places we go, um, to the people we interact with. All of it is a universal uh, process that is leading us to discover uh, love that we are and how to be loved, uh, be loved by um, the Creator. Okay. So that was what I wanted to first uh, recap. So that's why I'm really putting that out there. There's really no other purpose to which we come into the earth. Uh, also, in lieu of that, when we come into the earth, whether we know it or not, all of our relationships, uh, our connections with our parents and the friends and the family that we develop relationships with, there is a particular design and flow within them that sets the stage for us to have the greatest opportunity for us to discover the, the infinite and limitless power of love. Uh, so even though as we grow up, we sometimes don't understand the dynamics of our relationships, all of them are designed to push us into this direction. Uh, and what we're doing here is giving uh, examples and we're discussing uh, possibilities about how we can actually begin to understand the forces that surround us all the time, okay? Now, one of the things that we talked about in this uh, last week is called the law of appetite. And I introduced this last week, and basically to do a recap, is we talked about the fact that from birth, each of us has one thing in common, and we have an appetite for life. And as a baby, we have an appetite for life via uh, being fed milk. We have an appetite for life via being changed so that we can be comfortable, uh, for being, uh, uh, having affection shared to us, uh, having a relationship with mother and father. And it begins there, and our appetites from each stage to the next is constantly evolving. And as our appetites evolve, so does our experience in the world, all right? So when we talked about the law of appetite, one of the things that we pointed out is that every time we come to a particular point in our life and we find ourselves immersed in something and we feel like we can't grow and sometimes we feel entangled with it, we talked about how if we utilize the law of appetite properly, Meaning to give in to the hunger that is um, beyond where we are, then what that does is it. Um, uh, is that someone's phone? You think? I don't know if it's looping or something. Huh? I wonder if it's someone's phone line is looping. Anyhow, okay, so what we discuss is how the way that we move when we get stuck is. We, just, we have to be patient and sensitive enough to allow the hunger that is beyond where we are to begin to take place. So we talked about, we gave an example last week of about how when we get to age seven or so, uh, particular trips to go get ice cream may be the height of our day. And then at a certain point, we start to learn that the world is about more than trips to go get ice cream, and we start to give in to another hunger. And then that other hunger leads us into another experience, but the other one still exists. 
In the same way that that goes with um, ice cream, it goes the same way when we reach particular points when our appetite have, has brought us to a place that we can't get out of, like some type of insecurity, some sense of failure, uh, some kind of brokenness. And we talked about this because a lot of times, and I was talking to Joy about this before we left, the way we try to deal with our insecurity is we constantly go into our fears and our insecurity and we try to unfold it and layer it and layer it and find multiple realms of reasons and causes. And what we don't know is that by doing that, we are actually feeding that God. Y'all feel what I'm saying? So when we're always uncovering it, we're, always, we're basically feeding the, the God of that fear or the God of that insecurity. But when we're dealing with the law of appetite, then what we have to realize is that there is always something that we love, something that is tugging us, that we are hungry for, that is beyond whatever led us to that particular place. And that when we allow ourselves to disengage from unpeeling the onion, then we can actually begin to unpeel the life that is within us, and that is that hunger for life. Because the one thing that we're talking about with the commonality with the baby and the commonality with us grown babies in here is that deep down, the deepest appetite that we have is for the experience of life. You feel me? So we're just going through different stages of different things, discovering that experience of life and unfolding it to a different level. So when we get to the place of understanding that the deepest experience of life is that of the experience of love, which love is our soulmate. You feel what I'm saying? Love is our soulmate. And that's really what we're trying to uh, come into contact with. And I'm going to backtrack to something here. Because I got so much stuff on this, man. I thought this was going to take like four classes, but I might do this like all in 2011. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like every, when I left this class, I was like, dang, man. You know what I'm saying? I would have rather, I would have wished we had two or three more hours after I left. Because the crap started flushing in my head. You know what I mean? So now I'm going to have to kind of backtrack a little bit on this. Now, um, I want to go back into something here. We've talked about how when we're looking into the scriptures and it's talking about Adam, we know that Adam was not just some one man on the planet, but Adam represented all of us being connected. Kind of like all the, we were all the dots in Adam that were connected, like connect the dots. Now, when the scriptures are talking about Adam, we're talking about a being that did not even experience the limitation of being in the flesh. And what occurred is you start to see the creator saying, let me make you a woman. So he made distinctions, and that one became two. But the two were still one, right? But then when they fall, what happened is we began to experience everything as separate. That two became a distance now. It wasn't part of a whole. So now, after the so-called fall that we deal with, all of us that were the sparks that made up that one being, we all shattered and started to be born into this world over a series of time, okay? Now, I'm gonna just draw stick figurines here. This is gonna go back over some stuff we were talking about, but I just wanna lay this out before we go forward. So I'm drawing two figures on the board right now of a male and a female, right? Now, they down as us. This is us right now. We feel like we're separate, okay? But when we're talking about the soul mating, right, we're talking about something that this body that I've drawn, these stick figure bodies, is covering. So now I'm going to draw kind of like what's... I'm going to draw like what they are spiritually, as in kind of like what it would look like it's outside of them. Okay. So this is what's, what's really inside of them in their layers. Okay. 
Okay. And what they don't know while they're in the body is that they are really two parts of a whole. Okay? So now, when the two of them begin to journey back or begin to have a desire for the truest experience for life, right? They start to unfold these layers where they start to sense more connections between each other. Give you an example. Us, when the semen comes from our father and impregnates in our mother, that is the fall. That's the fall right there. You see what I'm saying? We are falling now out of heaven and beginning to condensate down into this physical world. And when we fall, we start developing and we sense now more and more as time goes that we're separate. But the, the median place is when we are in the womb of our mother, all right? The median place of the womb of our mother is like a place of heaven that we can still feel, but we also are connected to the physical. So we're in between worlds, okay? When you're in the womb, and this is from uh, the Hebraic uh, sciences, they tell you that angels are teaching you about everything in the universe. Mathematics, science, but all from a perspective of love, right? So you, at that point, are being imprinted upon by the universe about the reality of this, all right? Now, when you come out of the womb, right, out of the womb from birth, that is equivalent of the scripture when Adam and Eve had fallen and had been placed in skin. When that occurs and you come out of that womb, everything that you are being taught in there, amnesia occurs. But it's like Jason Bourne. If you've seen the movie Born Ultimatum, everything is still in there, but it's jumbled up, okay? So what happens is we come down to this experience where we begin to feel ourselves as separate and by a series of development, because this is still working upon us, you feel what I'm saying? As individuals, it's moving us through different steps of development, teaching us appetites, giving us uh, awareness of appetites for foods, for experiences, for travel, uh, for uh, emotional experiences, for thoughts and ideas, until we get back to a point where we can cut back on the switch to remind us of what we are being taught of in that womb, okay? Now this is the thing. All of us, when we are born, as I said, there is a beacon inside of us that when we cut it on, it begins to attract us to the people, places, and things we need to bring us back into experience of this oneness, okay? And when we turn that on, when we begin to search through that and we begin to give in to that hunger to experience life at its deepest level. And that life at its deepest level is about us experiencing ourselves as love and as being loved. And that goes back to that Gospel of Thomas. You shall know and then you shall also be known. Then that begins to trigger a movement of everything in the universe to, to begin to be on your side, basically. You begin to sense everything as being on your side. And that's where you begin to have experiences that relate uh, to you remembering when all of this was connected. All right? Does anybody have thoughts or questions about that before I move on to connect that? Okay? So we come in for the entire purpose of having that experience. The hungers are constantly bringing us beyond limitations. That's what the hunger the appetite, the giving into the appetite is leading us to that experience. Now I want to erase that joint because I might, have, <laughs> might have to write a little bit more on here. What do you mean by giving in to the appetite? Um, you, you are placed on this planet to indulge in your appetite. Um, so whatever you have an appetite for, you are set here to indulge in it but in the proper way. The way we indulge in appetites is the most limited way. 
okay? Because what we do is we, we, uh, we do it in a selfish manner, and it doesn't allow us to really get the feel out of things that we really are seeking to do. So even those appetites are there to lead us to the, the deeper hungers. You feel what I'm saying? So that's why, like, one of the things that's real is that when we start to understand this, and we see people who go in particular directions and get caught up in particular things, that's their journey to get to love, you know? But our journey, of, as far as what we're doing, is to provide an environment where we can um, help assist each other in a direction where we can uh, give into the appetite for life on, on the higher planes. Because if you have an appetite for the deepest experience with life, then all of the other things that you hunger for as far as your physical body, right, or your, your, your social life and everything, they take on the right proportions in order to keep you in a position where you can constantly be fulfilled uh, by your own soul. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what that's about. And I wanted to put that out there because one of the most dangerous things that we have um, in, in our culture is the extremes because we have one side of us uh, that is completely immersed in repressing our hunger and we have another side that is completely uh, per perverted in its indulgence and when you have those extremes separated inside of us we don't have balance in our ability to enjoy every moment you know and it's about pulling the two sides together so that the things that we uh, begin to indulge in, give us experience that is constantly unfolding who we are. Okay? All right, so I wanted to put that up there because when we're giving in to the, the law of appetite and we're allowing that appetite to lead us into the truest experience of who we are, which is um, uh, uh, the, the image and likeness of the creator, then it begins to burn through all the limitation uh, things that we eat from, and it takes us into those things that are limitless. Um, so that's the law of appetite, so I just wanted to build on that. We talked a little bit about last week as well that one thing the law of appetite does is when we begin to allow it to really take its course as far as who we are, uh, who we are spiritually, that it teaches us secrets of the universe such as that which you lack in your life or that which you know you are deficient in, you have to learn how to feed people in those things. Okay? So if you feel like you are deficient in being cared for and nurtured and loved, then you have to offer uh, care and nurture and love, but with the intent of it being not to give you a, a, a pleasure. Okay? And when we do that, what we do is we correct that space in ourselves. We clean out that space that we feel like wasn't able to receive. Okay, so that's one thing about the uh, law of appetite that we're talking about, that it actually leads us to be hungry to give, and that's how we actually get the experience that we actually need. That's how you expand yourself to be a vessel. So if, yeah, I'll use myself as an example. Um, all my life, I always felt different for some reason. I don't know if it was moving around or whatnot, but when I'm in groups of people, I always feel out of place to this day. I just never feel like completely settled in groups. Now, uh, what I used to do growing up is I gave into the appetite to try and secure myself by further isolating myself. You feel what I'm saying? Now, as I got older, what I realized is that the only way I could stabilize myself from feeling shy or, or like drastically uncomfortable around people is to give the experience of security to others who didn't feel comfortable. And that's why to this day, if I'm in a room, I can pick up on who feels out like an outsider. And I can either sit with them or position myself with them. I don't, it's not something you make obvious because it has to be for the right reasons. But when I give that experience for the purpose of them feeling secure, my security unfolds itself within me, okay? So that's one of the powers about this. And this is, has a lot to do with the soul mating process. Because a lot of times when I get on a topic like this, like in the past, deep down, a lot of people will say, you know, once you get past it, the details and things that you want in life are great but it's the deeper things that are important and the deeper things are these. 
Like when we say, what kind of relationships do we want from the opposite sex or with friends? What do we want? We want to be understood. We want someone who can feel us, who can relate to it, and who can improve it, right? Now, the problem with that in our human society is this, is that we don't create that ability to do that for others. So we want people to be psychically inclined towards us, right? We want them to be able to sense our feelings and the nuances about us because we don't like to do all that work by ourselves, right? But if you want that level of relationship, you have to develop the ability to give people the sense of being known and sensed and felt the same way that you wish to do. So if you want someone to be psychically inclined towards you, you have to develop the ability to be psychically inclined towards others. And how do you do that? Once again, you cannot trick the universe because the universe does not respond to action or words. It responds to intentions, right? A playground for that, for us to begin to develop um, the attraction for the soul mating process, to draw in the love that we are and to be loved, is for us to create the ability to give the experiences of the things that we were designed to need. Okay? So what am I saying by that? To give an example on the topic that we're talking about is being psychically inclined. Because psychic means to understand, to be uh, uh, sensitive to the mind, to the mental, to the, the, the essence of the person, right? What we have to do, and this is an easy technique for this, in order to attract that, we have to create that. And how do you create that? is by developing a desire to pick up on the nuances of others in your group of people. Do you feel what I'm saying? At your job, at your family house. See, that's the thing. We would rather focus it on like some newcomer that has something interesting about them to us. Do y'all feel what I'm saying? Like, this looks like a new friend. Let me develop it all here. No, the place to develop it is in the playground of life that is called your environment now. So if you develop, uh, the way to develop the power of attraction in your life, right, is to develop a, a genuine uh, curiosity and desire to understand the people around you. Do you, you, you feel what I'm saying? Because when you desire to do that, what you will begin to do is pick up means to pick up of the nature of people in your life circle and you'll begin to understand how to live inside of their shoes as opposed to your own shoes, okay? Now this is powerful science right now because, you know, before we lived in tighter knit communities where that was just a part of our life, but it's not so, more, so much now because if you think about it, all of us has the power at the drop of a second to cut everybody off. Do y'all feel what I'm saying? We all have that power now. We have the power to totally deny all of our connections, and we all do it. You know, a phone call, cut. You know, email, delete. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> delete. So you know what I mean? Just something crazy. You know, a relative, a relative call you from back in the day. You just delete. You know what I mean? We cut. You, we could. We have that ability to shut off. But what? The opposite of that is, is to really develop a desire to understand others so that we can give them that experience because that is oftentimes um, what we lack in our ability to tr attract. We're often more focused on how we feel about things and how people bring particular feelings to us. And what happens is the universe honors that every time by giving us people who are concerned about pleasing themselves and then we don't have the magnetism to connect. Y'all feel what I'm saying? Now, when we look at that, we get a kind of um, a idea of what the second uh, law that I want to introduce is uh, before I get into a little bit of the biblical stuff because I said that's what I was going to do this week. Um, the second law, which is directly connected to the law of appetite, is the law of static charge. How is that connected to appetite? When we hunger for food, right, we have thoughts that arise that give us a palette of things that we can choose to eat, okay? Now, the whole purpose of food is to do what for the body? To charge it, to nourish it, right? 
the same way as we have the appetite for life and the thoughts that arise for us to meet that appetite and lead us into that physical experience, the same way we have that ability when we are dealing with the law of appetite. Because the law of appetite governs our entire experience in the earth, but it's the law of static charge that determines what we attract and what we interact with and how do we elevate. When you deal with what uh, static is, elect electrical static, it's when things um, have friction with one another and they actually exchange, exchange electrons. And what they do is they create a positive or negative charge, so they create energy, right? Now, how does this relate with the law of appetite again? When we have a hunger or when we begin to give in to our deepest hunger for the experience of life, which is the, ex the deepest hunger in life that we can experience is to sense ourselves as connected to everything we experience in our world. Now, when we give in to that, a palette of thoughts arise that we have the ability to choose from. Now, when those thoughts arrive, whichever ones we seek to engage, it creates a rubbing effect between us and that thought, and it creates a, um, it creates a, 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 a energy charge. Matter of fact, it's a type of intercourse that we're having. Because when we look at um, what marriage is, and how people get married, and how people have intercourse, or how they have sex, what sex is purpose for is pure creation. It's for the, the purpose of physical sex is for healing and then building. So it's all one and the same. It's for healing and then it's for creating or creation. And when you look at the word creation, you're looking at two words. You're looking at the word create and you're looking at the word ion. So when we're dealing with intercourse of people or intercourse with ourself and thoughts and desires, we're dealing with the creation of ions, which is what static is. So when we're dealing with the law of appetite, what we have to recognize is that the thoughts that come up to us are giving us the creator's palette within us to decide what things we want to create a charge for. You feel what I'm saying? So when we meet up the um, appetite with the proper thoughts, then we're able to create the kind of energy to heal or repair or also to create energy. Now, when we look at the physical body and what happens in the physical body, we have intercourse with the food that we eat. And when we're hungry, all of us know particular foods like we talk about turkey, right? Turkey has tryptophan in it and it puts you to sleep, right? It takes your energy away. Also, you have on the other side something like um, pineapple or something like a banana with a lot of carbs in it that will give you energy. When we are looking at the law of static charge, what we have to recover understanding of is this, that when we're in the process of reinitializing, re reconnecting with the love that's in us, we have a palette of thoughts that we can create from which can match the type of experience that we're seeking. Okay, because just like uh, foods that we eat, thoughts have different weights. You know what I'm saying? Uh, matter of fact, words have different weights. Um, Nikki was talking about how unforgiveness has a lower vibration. Words have different weights, and so do thoughts. And as we're going through this process of increasing our appetite and eating from this energy, what we're given an opportunity to do is an opportunity to discern the palate of the thoughts that are, that are coming to us and use them to either create, we're looking to create lighter thoughts because lighter thoughts help us rise into our experience, right? So what we're doing is we have, we're, we're kind of like um, scientists and artists. We're scientists and artists of our own experience because what this allows us to do is take particular thoughts and decide which ones we want to have intercourse with or devour in order to create the right type of energy in our life. Because when we're looking at the scriptures or any of these talks we're doing, everything we're talking about now is about energy. The body is a carrier for energy, and energy in the body is used for us to create whatever type of experience we want to create. Because the secret of this thing and the science of this thing that we're dealing with is that whatever state of life you are currently experiencing is completely built by you. Every way you feel about things, 
every every in, in every manner of experience that you have, all of it is completely built by us based upon our appetites and what we charge in ourselves. So when we're dealing with this, we're taking uh, the, the context of our life from being on the plane of just seeing the effects of everything and we're going to the cause. Because when we go to this cause, what we're dealing with now is we learn how to mesh our appetite with particular thoughts to create the particular experience that we want. And the biggest thing about increasing our appetite is so that we can begin to connect more and more with thoughts with the right intent to become aware of the experience that we want to feel and to supercharge that experience, okay? Um, trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about that. All of our interactions, and this kind of goes back to the Nikki thing now as well that she was talking about, so I'm glad she brought it up. All of our interactions at every time is constantly creating a particular charge. Give you an example. I said last week that we talk a lot about soulmates, but a lot of times the way we approach our relationships, our, our future endeavors pertain, pertaining our relationships is according to body mates because we are conditioned by imagery of TV and everything that all of our experiences are external and they have to fit that line up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the ways that love teaches us is by ex allowing us to experience what it is not, okay? And it teaches us by what it is not by allowing us to go into relationships with ourselves, express by our relationship through others, others to give us a palate or a taste for what? The weight of thoughts. You feel what I'm saying? The weight of thoughts and the effect of appetites. So when we have that, even though we sometimes have a tendency to create a um, world where we indulge in those um, heavy weighted thoughts that keep us stagnant in life, we don't understand that that is a part of love's process to actually give us a taste palette for that which we do not want to eat from anymore. You feel what I'm saying? So once we are, have a recognition of that, then what we do is we're able to use our appetite now to change the palate that we're eating from and creating energy from. You see? Let's give you an example. If you have a relationship, I give it from my own example. Darn, I'm about to just go gangster with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My relationship before Joy was the one that taught me about love the most. It was the relationship that led me to Joy. Do you feel what I'm saying? Because in that relationship, I was pressing energy into something that was not reciprocating to me. That, do you not know that we are designed to think that that is a natural part of love? But you know what that comes from? That comes from a definition of love being in manipulation. Do you feel what I'm saying? Because a lot of times when we love, we want to control the outcomes of things based upon our, uh, our, our want to have a challenge or our loneliness or our insecurities. So we try to alter the effects when it's not even there. And what the universe does when we're in that state is it gives us something that will not bend but will actually go against us. Why? To show you that you have to know two sides of the experience of who you are. That which gives you, gives and reciprocates, and that which cannot be moved. The dark side. You, you, you feel what I'm saying? Part of the power of this process is that love, in order to balance you, this love takes you into experience that are lopsided in order for you to know what balance is. That's why everyone goes through a relationship that, you know, people have the ones that are you're completely ignorant of yourself, and it's just all good, you know, or until it just crashes, and then you go into some where it's completely lopsided, and one's putting in, and one's always distancing themselves, you know? And another part about this, like I said, I'm just going to everything that's coming in my head. A lot of, another part about this that is this, is that in the soul mating process, love is taking us through experiences to eliminate karmic debt. Okay? And what do I mean by karmic debt? This. And you see this in the scriptures. When you see Abraham approach Egypt and he has a negative situation there, if he doesn't understand what occurred, right, fully, then it leaves karmic debt 
for his son to revisit that place. Do y'all feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now a lot of times when we go through these things in life, all we're doing is we are coming through as um, brokers or financial advisors to situations that we need to assess and balance the debt of that particular situation. Because the soul mating process that you see throughout the scriptures is about settling the debt of separation. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Somebody said something. All right. So now, what, what is going on a lot through our process is that we are going through experiences that teach us about debt and it teaches us about abundance in order for us to manage those energies in ourselves. okay? Because if you don't manage those energies within yourself, you'll never be able to bring yourself into the type of experience that you need. Because this is the thing. No matter what you feel like right now, all of us are completely connected right now. All of us are already in the garden. The only difference is to the degree that you can experience it, that you marry that which is within you. Was I wanted to put this out there. Y'all ever seen the, you've seen the phenomenon in the scriptures where you have the, the twins all the time, the Cain and the Abel, the Jacob and Esau? When we're born into this body that I drew earlier as the stick figure, we have a twin that we were communicating with when we were in the womb. And that twin is the eternal image of who we are, basically. It's the light of who we are. All right? Now, after we're born, that light spends all of its time. You know how to talk about guardian angels and stuff like that? There is really not no guardian angel in the sense of some man following you around. What they're talking about is your light watches over you and it helps raise you. You feel what I'm saying? And it develops you uh, to the point that you can come into marriage with it. But that light in you has another half as well that creates a wave, so it's a light wave. And when we come into marriage of, of who we are and complete uh, the process of eliminating that karmic debt, it joins us to a other half in another body. Okay? And when you see the um, Abraham and the Sarahs, when you see the Isaac and the Rebecca's, what you're looking at are stories or examples of those who have come back to bring together, you know, they talk about Humpty Dumpty, they have brought God back together again, okay? So the journey of soul mating has taken us to a series of processes and experiences that gives us the um, opportunities to eliminate uh, karmic debt or things like bitterness, unforgiveness, confusion, or hatred that has been left in our experience from before. So we're constantly moving through that and every time we move and we engage that, uh, we engage that debt, we create a space in ourself to, to basically have an infilling of the experience of who we are. All right? So that's what we're moving towards. So each one of us has a, a twin of light within us and we have another half of that light that exists as well. So I'm gonna put this out there. You have many soulmates, but you only have one twin. You feel what I'm saying? You only have one twin. All right? But the many soulmates bring us here to work on collective issues that are left behind. All right? So now, we, we're dealing with the static charge. Can you speak more of the twin? Yeah. Um, this is because you got into the whole balance, like the light as a wave and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like. Okay. Um... I'm trying to give an easy way to kind of illustrate this through words because I know we have people on the phone. When, they were, when we talk about an Elohim made man, and then it said that um, uh, he, made, uh, he made both he male and female, what you're dealing with is basically two parts of a whole, the light and the wave. You know what I mean? The, the energy and the, the wave frequency of it. Before we were born in this physical, let's talk about that seed that we talk about before the Big Bang, right? Before the Big Bang, that seed was all of us and we were in it, right? In many different kind of aspects. But each one of us had a half within that whole seed. When, this, when, the, when the creation began and God spoke and the explosion happened, those holes, the two halves of that hole, 
exploded and started to manifest as separate. All right. So though, even though there are a lot of us here uh, who all came out of that same P in that experience, there was parts of us that is there is a direct other half of us. All right. So to give an example, uh, Brian and Janice could be part of the same whole, but we are still related to them. Do you see what I'm saying? So when we're talking about a twin, uh, we're talking about the manifestation of the other half of you that manifests in this other body. Okay? So that, that's what I was saying before, that you have many soul mates. You have family members. You have these kind of individuals, uh, family and uh, things of that nature who come to help you see who you are. But when you get to the point of coming to wholeness of who and what you are, you have an opportunity to see the other half that was in the beginning. The two half that come together to bring a representation of the whole. So when you see the Abraham and the Sarahs, or you see the Jesus and the Marys, you're talking about a journey to come together to bring back a picture of that whole. All of, uh, let's use Jesus' example, all of Jesus' relationships with his mom, with his father, with the children of Israel, with the rabbis, with the sages, and wherever else he journeyed, those people came in contact with him to bring him back to the experience of seeing himself as a whole so that he could connect with his other half. That's kind of, do you feel what I'm saying? It's kind of crazy, but you have to come into a, a whole of you in order to see the manifestation of the other half that you are. Because when you get to this thing, there is an experience, and this is what we're moving to. We're moving to this experience being expressed like collectively. Because we see it in the examples through individuals. But when you see those individuals coming together, and especially when we look at the Adam and Eve and the Abraham and Sarah, every time you see those types, you see a complete shift in the entire consciousness of mankind concerning the creator. So when I'm talking about the two halves of the twin souls is what I'm talking about. You ever heard that, y'all ever heard that phrase, it's twin souls, a twin flame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, twin soul, twin flame is talking about something that is beyond soulmates. All of us in here are soulmates. But the twin is the other half of you before the fall. That's, that's good. You did a good job, I guess, differentiating the roles from soulmate versus the yeah. twin. Yeah, yeah. Now, the thing is so powerful because when you get into the concept of all of this, the whole dealing of soulmates starts to take you out of the third dimensional prison. Because what happens is this. There are soulmates of us, and Dern, you know what, I'm just going to go all out in 2011. I'm just going to say whatever comes to my mind. I ain't going to, like, dot anything up. But we have relationships with other soulmates who are not in bodies right now. You see, who have already passed. But they're a part of what we do. You see? And even when we deal with the concept of the twin soul, right? One may be in the flesh and another may be with the creator in the spiritual realm. And they may have a marriage that way. Do you feel what I'm saying? Because they may not be able to come down together. But what we're dealing with this is we're dealing with this in such a manner that we come to a more holistic experience within ourselves, that we see it reflected in all of our relationships. And the, the, the most powerful way for us to begin to mate our, the, our twin or the light that we are, that is always hovering within us and around us, is to have such a desire uh, to give that experience to mankind that you do it even if it's the next two generations that may actually feel it. Do you, you feel what I'm saying? Because a lot of times we get hooked into this thing about the experience that we want to have in life concerning relationships. You feel me? So, you know, so, so like we deal with this thing and we, we look at our life and growing up I was like, you know, I look at other people's parents and I would say, how come I don't have that experience with my parents? How is my family not structured like that? You know, why does my mom not give hugs or something like that? Because he wasn't supposed to. That wasn't what was going to help me, you know. But when we get to a point of breaking from why was it set this way and that created this insecurity or this strength and all of that, to the point that we want to give people the experience 
of loving who they are and expressing that love, that draws it within us and we can actually accelerate our process of all of our relationships by having that intent. Does, does that, that make sense? So that's what I'm dealing with here. And I really want to get to this point that the intent is how you begin to channel the energy of the universe. It is the intent. That is really the only piece that we have missed. Because when we're looking at everything, we have had the things, we have had the appetite. We've had the appetite to have the experience. But what we are uh, in a place to do now is to align with the intent that is already available to us. And what our generation is, and when I say I'm not talking about the age group, but I'm saying the generation of us in the earth is here to do now is to begin to flow with that which is already available to us. Because I'm telling you right now, to be honest with you, this year we have an opportunity to exponentially experience that which we are supposed to give to others. And it's simply by aligning, and that's why we have to um, transform our language even. You remember when you say, oh, it's hard? You got to throw that crap out. You got to reprogram your being by saying, this is what I'm here to do. I already have it. I'm walking the experience out. You see? A lot of the experiences we have had with lovelessness were uh, contractual agreements we made with our twin while we were in the womb. Do you see what I'm saying? When we talk about karmic debt, when we were in that womb, the light within us was teaching us that, look, this is all a game. You're going to go into this earth, and there is particular debts left in the earth from hundreds of years ago, and you're going to meet a particular individual and have a bad relationship so that you can come and interact with that debt so that you can settle it in yourself. Do you feel, you feel what I'm saying? A lot, so a lot of times when we come into beefs with like a particular teacher, that's from something ancient. It could be from tribes that met, you, you know, the hundreds of years ago that never, re, that, never, um, that never reconciled their differences. That has to take place in us because we have an opportunity to settle so much debt because there's so much wealth available. And we come into that situation and it may be a uh, brush in with negativity or beef that we have. But we don't understand a lot of times is that that was a part of the process for us to unlock love that had been locked away for centuries or thousands or billions of years. Do you see? And so when we um, engage all of our relationships uh, with people, as I said last week, all of our relationships with people are some type of reflection with the relationship that we have with ourselves. And even aspects of ourselves we yet do not know. Do you see? So when we're dealing with these different relationships, it's an opportunity to deal with the law of appetite in order to increase our hunger to transform the way we experience ourselves through our situation with that relationship. And that's why we come into these bonds where you feel very strong feelings with people, um, but you may have never known them. It's because there was some kind of contract set there from before that we're here to bring some type of life to. Okay, so all of our relationships are set on a governed path by um, the twin that is within us that we are trying to come back into a relationship with. And that's what leads us and moves us towards our relationships uh, with one another. All right, so when we deal with um, different relationships that we have, especially pertaining to our families, right, because I'm really I was talking to Pastor Richards about this, particularly to your families. A lot of the way that you can advance yourself is by understanding how to settle your feelings towards family if you have not resolved them. Or keep balanced the good ones that are there or rebuild ones that have been destroyed from the past. Because when you deal with uh, those relationships and you resolve how you feel about them, and I said this before, not necessarily change them, but resolve how you feel about them, you also give yourself a springboard to operate in the different compartments of who you are. Okay, because your parents are different uh, compartments of who you are that you often have to come to grips with. And once you resolve those relationships, it gives you the opportunity to see your relationships in the world that re represent a part of your experience in a better way. Helps you relate to them a little bit better, you know? Janelle? Yes. Could you explain if, if, if it's related to what we're talking about? 
about why do we manifest as our female side versus our male side or vice versa. Why do, okay. I got you. Um, okay. We manifest, the, the reason we manifest that way is because, I, I said something last week. Before the Big Bang, love existed and covered eternity and every dimension and every possible place where life could ever exist, right? But in order, if, if, even though that love existed, that love needed to be experienced. So imagine you have all these billions of dollars and you control the globe, but you don't have anybody to experience it with, right? What you want more than anything, and you can see this um, on that Tom Hanks movie, what's that, A Castaway? Mm -hmm. That he was on that island so long that he had to create a reflection of himself. So it's the same thing. The creator completely uh, saturated all of existence, but the love that existed needed to be experienced. And the only way um, the love that existed could be experienced is to create an opposite of itself. And that's where we came into play. So when we come down and we're born as male or female, it's about the oneness creating two so that the two can actually go as far apart as possible, but then come back together to recreate the experience of love. Does that make sense? And, but, and we don't, we like, we don't, I, I'm, I'm not really understanding. I, I guess when we met up, when I come in and I came in as a female, mm -hmm. was it to learn how to express my maleness or yeah, yeah, you need to recognize being female? What is there a reason why you express one over since technically in the spirit realm we are androgynous right. being, then why is it a reason why we actually express as female? Because it makes, I, I ask that question because sometimes I think about in cases of homosexuality, uh -huh. and because we are androgynous, that there may be a reason why, although there are people to the heart of, I mean, to, to be honest, to the root of the problem, they really come in not feeling like they were born the way that they feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I, I mean, that has made me at least try to express empathy because there I mean there are those who just do what they do because they just want to experience whatever. Right. But there right. are people who really struggle with that. It's a struggle and so I'm wondering if there was there's a reason why we express or manifest as female versus male or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, yeah, and I'm gonna go back into that. Now like I'm gonna go back into this again. In order to create an experience, right? You have to have opposites. If you have eternal light, but you don't have it shining on something, that light doesn't, ex it's, it's basically a, a, a it doesn't, it, there's no experience. It's just like the only reason, the purpose of a, 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 the, a light bulb has purpose because there is someone to see it or to receive that light. So when we come in as male or female, it is for the purpose of coming back into relationship with each other to create the living experience of the creator. And it is partially what you, what you were saying. We come in as, you come in as a female to bring balance to the maleness in you, just as a male comes into earth to find balance of the female within us. And that's why um, from the beginning of our life, from birth, we are intricately connected to one another. Like, look at this. A, a, a male breastfeeds from the mother, right? And then when he gets older, he spends all of his life getting back to breast. Y'all see what I'm saying? Like someone would take that funny, but it's real. And what he's doing is he's trying to reenact the wholeness that he felt when he was breastfeeding. Because that is actually an example of the, the maleness receiving from the from the feminine aspect of God because that's what a, the father and mother are supposed to represent in the earth but when the two come together they recreate the infinite uh, existence of the creator's love and the creator 
has an opportunity to experience that love through those two opposites. Okay. You know, and that's that's really what we're here. We're really here to come back into the androgynous snake, androgynous state. I almost said androgynous snake. I was like, and that may that may really have some real stuff in it. I'm gonna look at that. But um, you know, that's why you have the when you see generations where the sex is really rampant. They are simply trying to come back into oneness, but they're doing it according to, uh, you know, the physical nature. But when we get on this level of um, trying to bring balance to the maleness uh, inside of the woman and the femaleness inside of the male, then we recreate that experience and we change the way people um, um, see the world and see, see who they are. Man, there was something that I wanted to say with that. There was something else that I wanted to say. There was a thought that was hitting me. But does that make sense to y'all? Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. When males and females no longer are responding to each other correctly, right, it creates, in some cases, the homosexual patterns. Because some aspects of homosexuality is completely about spiritual laziness. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Slackly spiritual men want women who can be their doormats. Why? Because they don't want to do the work of coming into balance with the feminine aspect of the creator in them. Okay? Or a slackly, a slackly spiritual woman will deal with a controlling man or a man she can control because she doesn't want to face the masculine aspects in herself. Now, when people begin to do that, it creates a uh, energy force in the atmosphere that says, kind of like, well, what the heck, I just deal with the same sex. And that's really what a joker is doing when you're dealing with a doormat woman, right? Or, or a manipulative woman. Even a man who deals with a, manip manip a manipulative woman is saying, I don't want to be in control of my masculine process. So when that happens, that thought goes out in the atmosphere. And to give you a real practical, it's played out in TV sitcoms which is what generations are being raised now, because if you want to test people IQ, you got to test it on pop education now, you know? But how that is affecting the, uh, the sitcoms and everything is showing very lazy relationships that don't have to do with bringing balance to who and what we are spiritually, which is what all the stories in the scripture are about, scriptures about. So that's what produces um, a lot of the kind of um, sexual... Uh, orientation confusion in, in some cases. I notice I'm saying some because there are a lot of dimensions of things and a lot of ways things manifest. I do believe, to be honest, some people come here homosexual in order to build higher grades of love in the earth, in order to teach people tolerance and how to understand other ways of being uh, human. But I did want to just touch on that right quick. Jamil, can you speak of what it looks like when we are not confronting, but dealing with that other side of ourselves. Like for example, you spoke of the, the spiritually simple mm -hmm. example. Can you speak of what it should look like? What it should look like as far as when we are dealing properly? Mm -hmm. Well, what it looks like is, and I gotta, there's so many examples that can be given with that. But to give an example on the male side, when a male is dealing with um, balancing the femininity in himself, he actually appears to become more manly, more of a man. And the reason why he appears to become more of a man is because he is becoming more whole. So when a man becomes uh, more connected to the feminine in him, it creates a uh, greater level of confidence, a greater level of ability for him to express his ability to provide, but what that all is undergirding is by his ability to tap into his intuitive aspects, you know what I mean? His ability to feel and to nurture. So to give an example, um, now when a man is dealing with women, instead of act coming just with how men may have been programmed to say, I, I got to be the man and make all of these decisions for y'all, he can be responsible in the way he needs to be for them, but he also can submit to what those women are uh, saying or giving him as an experience to who he is. Okay, so he can both take, he can both give and receive, 
and he can do it all by being the type of man that he needs to be. So he can deal with, um, it's like a man with his daughter, oh, give a good example. A man who doesn't deal with his feminine side has a hard time dealing with his daughters when she reaches puberty. Okay? And the reason why is because he hasn't addressed his ability to nurture changes in himself. You feel what I'm saying? But when a man begins to deal with uh, the feminine side of himself, he can deal with whatever changes go on in his daughter because it represents changes he's already balancing in himself. Okay? So I'm, I'm just giving multiple examples out because I want to throw them out there. But what it looks like is when we deal with the other side of ourselves, we begin now to have the ability to relate to people from the inside out rather than the outside in. So when people come to you with different things that they're thinking about or feeling or problems that they have, when you're dealing with the other side of yourself, you tap into the way that they feel. And that's why... Like, one of the dumbest things that I hear people say is stuff like, a man, when a man says, well, you're not a man, so you can't understand. That's bull crap. If you're dealing with who you are, you can understand. You feel what I'm saying? So if a woman comes to me and says a problem that could be completely feminine hygienist, right? Some kind of stuff like that, you know? <laughs> like, this is how my PMS makes me feel towards my uh, towards my kids, okay? Now, if I'm dealing with who I am inside, then I am completely able to listen to her nuances and tap into what she's saying. But if I'm not, I shut down because I'm like, I deal with the outer. You know what I'm saying? That outer is not my experience. Likewise, a female is able to do the same thing, okay? So that's, that's uh, in kind of a few examples what it looks like when we are dealing with our other side. Why well, can someone speak from the feminine perspective of that? It, just, you could just flip it around. You can flip it around, because I'm going to give an example. Uh, uh, let's go on the menstrual cycle stuff, right? The fact of the matter is, males have cycles as well. Now, when a female is dealing with her masculine side, and the male starts to, you know, and the male at a particular periods within his cycle begins to get out of his element, right? Even though he may not have a menstruation, he is still going through an aspect of his period in his cycle, then she can tap into the experience she has and into his and make the proper calculations as far as their relationship to understand what's happening, give the proper space and the proper closeness. So you can give that understanding based on how the relationship is operating. So it goes back and forth either way. But what it does is it gives an opening. It gives an opening when you're dealing with yourself to relate with the person based on how they're feeling to make it take it all the way down to the simple. You can relate to them based on how they're feeling rather than how they're appearing. Okay? Uh, anybody else, y'all can help me out if you have other thoughts on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But in actuality, um, that is how we were operating before we fell. This stuff about, and pastors has gone into this before, this stuff about women hating their periods is a projection from men who don't deal with their femininity because you can't have sex during that time. So a man now who's dealing with his feminine side, right? Uh, if the woman's going through that and she needs her space, he understands that, vice versa. When the male goes through things and he needs his space, it's vice versa. She understands it. So the experience goes uh, in understanding that we are all going together in one cycle just through a different experience of that cycle. Okay? And this is what causes us to have a breakdown in our relationships because we don't, we do not, set within ourselves space to give the connected experience to others in a balanced way. So now we don't recognize how to connect or how to recognize imbalances. So we keep throwing dirt on them because of how we feel. You feel what I'm saying? So when we're here and we're dealing with um, this and how we move, our role is to basically understand these dynamics that we observe in life and the dynamics that we see in the scripture in order to repair how we're operating with one another in order to bring about that experience of oneness. Okay. Um, 
in the scriptures in Genesis, every time they say, uh, and Adam knew Eve or so-and-so knew someone, you see afterwards that they get pregnant and they have a child. Okay? They don't never say they made love. It said they knew one another, right? No, it say oh, it say new. new. Yeah, it ain't say lay down. It just say. I thought it say someone say they lay together. Oh uh, well, maybe later. Yeah, it okay, might, okay, you're right. It probably say they lay with one another. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> so anyhow, what we're looking at with the word no, though, mm -hmm. what we're looking at with the word no in Hebrew, that word no is yada. Okay, yada means to perceive. So the original form of intercourse between the two initially occurred on the level where they perceived each other from the inside out. So when they made love, they, you see this is the thing, let me throw this out there. In order for you to really make love to someone in the physical, you have to make love with the feminine aspect of yourself in the spiritual. Okay, And in order for a, firm, a woman to make love to a man in the physical, in its most complete way, she has to make love with the masculine aspect of herself in the spiritual. So that when they come together, they are perceiving each other from the inside out. And the physical is just a manifestation of what's already going on. Okay, Because when we are dealing with it on that level, you're dealing with the power to take down matrix systems, okay? And they show you this in all these movies, uh, the matrix, right? You're dealing with intercourse that was going on in the spiritual, as above, so below, all right? That's why these twin souls and soulmates come in, to desecrate aspects of the matrix and elevate aspects of Zion that are underneath all of it. Uh, the same thing in the movie Inception, because if you look at Inception, your man, uh, Leonardo, right, he was a, com consummated with his wife. You remember? The wife that had already died, holding an image in his head, trying to control an image. Mm -hmm. Think about how when you're first growing up, you're implanted with images and you try to hold on to that thing for the longest about what you think the opposite sex is. That was the... that type of relationship that we have with each other and ourself is what keeps us trapped in loops. But what happens, if you notice the other chick that came in, Juno, the Juno chick? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about, I don't know her name. The chick off of Juno. No, we got Did you see the movie? No. That's oh, cool. darn, I was. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm like, dang, you ain't seen Juno. But anyways, like yeah, the architect. Now, if you notice when she comes in, look at this, because you got to understand directors put the imagery out there for you to decode it if you're at that level, right? That chick come in with the same hair color, same type of skin, but just slightly different. You see that? So what's really happening now is his name was Cobb, right? Leonardo DiCaprio. When she comes into the picture, what's happening? He's ready to get back home to see his kids. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, she called him off his stuff, too. I mean, that the image in his dream yes. couldn't, couldn't provide a reflection for him of things yes. that he needed to correct. But this other woman yes. could, the one in reality. Now, I mean, people would rather deal with the image that they create. Right. You know, because, like you said, because they can control it or whatever, but, you know. Del, you summed it all up right there mm -hmm. what, about what we're dealing with, the soul mating process. Mm -hmm. He started making love to the feminine side of himself. That's why she manifested on the scene. Remember, because who who gave her who gave her to him? The Father. You see what I'm saying? It's the design of the universe that when you're ready, because the kids represented um, the experience of love, the memory of of who we were before we fell down to this thinking we're separate. So when he was ready to get back to heaven, so to speak, or the dimension of love, then the Father provided him with a help me or the other side of himself. And it provided that challenge that you're talking about. Because she was the one who was like, oh, you know, hell no, I'm not going with you on to this dream until we go deal with some stuff. And she was the one who traveled down into the depths of his dream world to, to show him how effed up the stuff was, so to speak. You see what I'm saying? So when we're ready to trigger the deepest 
the deepest, when we're ready to give in to the deepest appetite for life, that movie shows you how the universe manifests uh, what you need to move in that direction, okay? Because she was actually the Eve that he was separated from, you know? And she was the one who helped him disconnect from the uh, created image that we keep in our mind that keeps us trapped in a lonely experience in our body. I have something to share with that, and it's mm -hmm. not from like the people perspective, mm -hmm. but more toward like the mating experience in myself. Mm -hmm. um, lately, it's been happening again where I've been focused on like what's going to happen, how am I going to pay for this, blah blah blah. So situations have been created, like for me to be worried about money, mm -hmm. and so the more I have learned to push out the thoughts of panic, again, I'm becoming more centered on, I have everything I need. Like, it's gonna come, yeah. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, now I get what you're saying about it. So it's, it happens even in circumstance, not necessarily just people. Yeah, circumstances are people. Circumstances are created by people. It's, or attitudes. Yes. Okay, okay. None of, that's why I'm, I'm slowly just, you know, I don't even want to say the word spirituality anymore. Because that has even taken on a religious kind of dead and energy. All we're talking about here is life, you know. Life manifests through people, places, and situations, but they all come from us. Now, that's a good example of what you did because that deals a lot with um, how to root ourselves in the um, static energy. You created a charge of saying, I have enough, mm -hmm. Right? And then what you're really saying beyond those words is you're saying, I am enough, mm -hmm. okay? So a lot of times we create feelings of anxiety and situations come to mirror it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And they come to give you an opportunity to reassert who you are mm -hmm. because this is the truth of things. Two objects cannot exist in the same place forever. Only one can. So when you assert who you are, everything has to submit to who you are and vanish itself because you were the one that created it in the first place. You see what I'm saying? So when we're dealing with things, uh, and just think about this now. Everybody has stayed in a friendship or a relationship way too long before. <laughs> and the reason we're doing that is because we're trying to assert God in the lower realm. Do you feel what I'm saying? We're trying to assert God in the lower self. Because the reason we stay in things is because we're trying to assert our will to alter the situation. But it doesn't work that way because of the intention. But the opposite of that is true in that when our intentions are correct and we're dealing with particular issues like feelings of lack or how am I going to do this or how is this going to play out, is the way we diffuse it is by doing exactly what you said. We have the ability to place ourselves in any feelings or thoughts of negativity and establish ourselves there as the Christ in the flesh and diffuse all of it because it cannot exist there in the same space. And this exists in our journey with our relationships as well, that whenever something manifests, whether we create it or whether it was debt left in the earth by other men who believe they were separated from the creator, when we come into those situations, the way we reverse the debt of, the, of our debtors is by establishing ourselves in that place and allowing the wealth to establish itself and become dominant, the dominant kingdom in that uh, attitude or that thought or that arena. Okay. Um, back to Yada. <laughs> so, what we're dealing with. Yeah, yada. What do you say? Yada, yada. Um, so this yada is powerful because this is this yada is really the main goal that we come here to have, and we come here to have intercourse with who we are because that is what brings us the experience that we have. And if you look at that word, which I love, I was talking to Brian about this before. Look at that yada, you see where they came up with Yoda. You see, because what was Yoda? He was a figure which represented. Um, teaching people how to experience themselves. Because what was he was always saying? Trust in the force, it's all around you, it is all in you. So that in that yada is um, the yod, uh, which is the Y in Hebrew, or the J, and the yod has to do with something we were talking about with how male and female are connected. The yod 
which is the initial power of this word, has to deal with uh, a being a pregnant masculinity or a pregnant man, if you will. But we're not talking about like in the headlines of that <laughs> woman that turned into a man. We're talking about something spiritual. We're talking about the fullness of femininity and masculinity and its ability to become an experience within us. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So when we see the yada or the yoda, or this is also in the root word for Judah, which is praise, right? Is that when we, um, when we come into an, and when we have a desire to have an experience with who we are, and we give into that hunger and charge the thoughts that come that match it and build it, it allows us to impregnate our reality with the type of experience that we were sent here to have in the first place. And it also gives us the ability to heal where there are debts and pains and brokenness. And it also gives us the ability to create upon those restored foundations. So when we're dealing with this, this gives us the um, opportunity to uh, have an experience with the intricacies of who we are. Because I'm going to get into next week how to break down. I'm going I'm to use like, we're going to get on some hands-on type stuff when we start like sounding out our names and things like that. That shows you the energies that you're working with in a practical way. And when you feel and resonate with that energy and you become pregnant with the other half of you, then you will start to experience your relationships around you matching that, experiences, that experience within. Okay? And it will also take you out of experiences that are imbalanced. Okay? Because we're having to uh, correct debts uh, within ourselves that we feel that we have to pay out in a, a kind of like bondage way. This takes us out of that kind of stuff because when we start to mate uh, with the, the light that's in our soul, it takes us away from this feeling that we have to pay for other people's debts, you know, in some kind of in bondage, kind of in prison type of way. So that's the intercourse. There's no proper, in, any intercourse you have with someone uh, in a manner in which you didn't have intercourse with yourself to give life will always take from you. In every conversation, it'll take from you, you know? And we come to realizations of that, and as our hunger grows, we'll be like, you know, during my, my conversations with this person, it took from me, and as we think it's that person, right? But it's about us. We didn't create the environment in ourselves to give that energy, okay? So we have to begin to change how we approach things by setting in ourselves environments to give everything that we're looking for. And when we begin to set in ourselves uh, the desire to give everything that we're looking for, then the thoughts that can charge that ability will come to us and we'll recognize the lighter ones from the heavy ones that keep us away. Okay? Or vice versa. The light one, lighter ones that float away and the heavy ones that root us in that feeling. Okay? Uh... Thought a question on anything at this point, because I'm going to take a little junction point for a second. Can you connect again um, the yada and the static charge? Okay. The yada is the orgasm that comes as a result of us giving into our appetite to become the creator and us drawing the thoughts that can be impregnated by that hunger. So, so um, you got it is this manifestation of Yes. This. Yes, because the, the, the yod, the yod in that, in the, the yod and the yoda or yada, it's really the same word if, if you understand like Hebrew, is it's the hand of power. It's the manifestation of of the will and the intent. So when we're pulling these together in ourselves, the yada is the um, the yada is the feeling uh, you, did, were you here when I did the intellect and emotion thing? When I was saying that the, uh, when, when we become, when the light rushes in us and we start to work with it. Oh, and the we, internal lecture. Yeah, yeah. So when we connect our appetite to experience being the creator, which is the, to give life, and we charge that with the thoughts that uh, begin to be drawn to us, there's an orgasm that occurs that, is produced in, and what yada you can put it in is a type of knowing. 
Like there's y- y- y'all ever you feel these moments where you know to such a degree, and I'm gonna be honest, and this is real. There are sometimes you come into a knowing that you can know you you know that you could walk through a place contaminated with bubonic plague and you know it could not contaminate you because the knowing is so powerful in the impregnation. And when you have the yada or the knowing or the intercourse with the um, the thoughts that you connect with the appetite that you feed on, what happens is situations arise in order for you to impregnate obstacles with that life. I'm going to give you physical impregnation, uh, personal situation between me and Joy. When um, Joy got pregnant, was getting ready to give delivery to Cairo, that was right smack when that swine flu was rampant. Do y'all remember the swine flu? Everybody was like, get your flu, get your, get your flu shot, get your do all this, do that. We heard that from everywhere. But there was a knowing inside of us that said, that's not what we're supposed to do. Okay? Because the knowing will establish in you a confident understanding of how you're supposed to deal within that particular situation. Now, it's not something that you go broadcasting. Because it's an internal thing. And that may not, and the reason you don't broadcast it is because guess what? Somebody need to get that thing. Because they're not going to be confident without the, the swine flu vaccine. You see? Mm-hmm. S- somebody by us saying, oh, you know, we're not going to do that, they're going to be disturbed and say, well, they're stupid. Or they're going to say, well, maybe we should change what we're doing. And it's not, it didn't come from knowing inside of them. But when we operate on that, or when any of us operate uh, on a form of knowing, is we now alter the reality of that situation that is around us for anyone else who desires to come into the Yoda or the Yada. Do do y'all see what what I'm saying there? So that's like a a physical manifestation of it. And a matter of fact, anytime we are mating with our soul and we come into covenant in relationships with each other, it is precisely to come into this level of intercourse in order to alter the situations that are coming uh, w- coming into the earth with mankind. Like, one thing I know we got to talk about on Saturday is them birds and the fish. Man, I'm, I'm ready to explode on that, man. Drop. I can't, huh? Oh, I know you heard about the birds and the fish, Janine. You heard of, there's like the thousands of birds that just fell out of the sky in Arkansas. And in Louisiana, and then hundred, of, uh, like a hundred thousand fish, showed up simultaneously in the in the waters. Yeah, in in Arkansas and Louisiana, mm-hmm. just out of and, and this is the thing, the birds they're not burnt up because they said firecrackers. <laughs> when, when they said the firecrackers, that was the most ridiculous thing, man. So I'm like, come on now. They said firecrackers. They said lightning, or they said hell. Yeah. Yeah. And stress. Oh, stress. stress. They said the birds were stressed too. Now, what is stress from? Now, you can show it's not on now anymore. Where that was happening. When the birds were falling out of the sky, mm-hmm. I do, and I don't. I know exactly what you're talking about, but I don't remember the show. But when they were saying that stuff, I was like, okay. So did the firecrackers scare the fish dead to the top? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Flash forward. There you go. See, oh, now I'm going to tell you something. All this stuff is connected because all of these shows, they're telling you, yeah, I don't want to get on my show routine. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, we definitely have to go into that. And why do we have to go into it? Because the, the yada or the knowing, you have to create a reality opposite of the one that people live in. And that's what creates balance. You see what I'm saying? And let me let me go on one more thing. As of right now, I've yet to hear an answer concerning the fish and the, the fish and the birds. And the birds were not cut up. They were not burnt up. They didn't have bullet holes or firecrackers in them. You know. So there's not. You know. So we're dealing with a phenomenon that needs to be impregnated with understanding. Because and I got you, Regina. When you got the uh, the D in there, it's, it's uh, dalet. The letter Dalet, which is the root of Da'at, or knowledge. And the A's, the double A is will or spirit. So you're talking about impregnated with the with the um, knowledge and will of the spirit, the knowing, you know. But let me let me get you. I'll have to speak to someone, and I, I know maybe you may have more knowledge on this about the pole shifting. 
Mm -hmm. Because um, one thought that I was having this this morning was this idea that as this is happening, like even the very atoms that we're composed of will have that rotation. Mm -hmm. And so I've listened to some blog talk radios and have had the thought myself that um, when people talk about like the extinctions and things like that, it's it's for those beings or, or for those attitudes that don't have the ability to realign with what's happening metaphysically and physically at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts on the whole, like, what's going on in the EM atmosphere right now and, and that type of thing. No, I, I personally don't know. Okay. I, I know there is a connection. Like, I know the birds and the uh, fish uh, definitely represent something. And it is, I mean, there's a reason why it's going through what's going on that has been on in the spiritual yeah. or the manifest of the physical. I do, I do want to say this, though, that the, um, the destructions that we see in the scriptures concerning the floods or even when you talk about the uh, Egyptian plagues, mm -hmm. those are examples of pole shifts mm -hmm. in encoded in the Bible. And when you have the pole shifts, life as we know it, how it existed prior, cannot exist in the same way going forward. So everything we're doing is related to that because when we're talking about the pole shift and the electromagnetic field, we're talking about the spiritual realm. It's contained completely of light and energy and intelligence in it. So even what we're doing now is related to it, except the only thing is by us dealing with um, who we are beyond the physical, we're actually dealing with light from the other side of all the changes. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know? So that's the power of what we're doing. And that's why I'm on this, because the soul mating process has to do with us connecting with who we are beyond the dimension of time and space. And that's why when you go into the scripture and you deal with Abraham and Sarai, right, they're living in Haran, and then all of a sudden the scripture says, I think in Genesis 12, it says, um, Abraham, get ye out of your father's house. It's dealing with him leaving time and space as he knows it to go on a journey so that the H can be added to his and Sarah's name which means they transcend time and space their breathing becomes different their experience becomes different because they made it the other side of their soul so now that's how he becomes instead of his character or name giving him the power and the definition to simply be a man or a father in the earth right on a natural level he now becomes the progenitor of all those who will seek after the light after him. So now he transcends time and space, you see? And that was uh, actually, the, that is the initialization of the soul mating process and how it goes from, Adam and Eve went from the spiritual to the physical. Abraham is, went from the physical to the spiritual as a reversal of the process, giving us a map of how we unfold. Because as we begin to unfold, and we start to see ourselves in the spiritual stories rather than reading them, we start to see ourselves in the same places that we see these characters. And that's what gives us the ability to be um, like ahead of the curve. Because a lot of people are dealing with all their information backwards, man. They're dealing with it based on um, what is about to happen. We're dealing with it from it has already happened. We're on the other side. We're aligning ourselves with what's on the other side. In the bird, because you know, Ryan threw this out, and I was thinking about this too. He said the bees, birds, and the fish, all of those creatures represent very divine aspects of the creator relationship to man. So the fact that they're moving has a lot to do with, um, I ain't going into it. Craig told me don't go into, don't go into that. I gotta, we got to all be here, you know what I mean? Got to have past riches here and everything before we. Uh, going into that type of stuff. But it's about us impregnating context so that the universe can align itself to our context. Because the level of your life and how high it can ascend is based upon the context and the altitude that you give it. So if mankind gives a context to his life uh, concerning seeing himself divided from God and divided from one another and everything ending, then that's exactly what will occur. That world will end, but if we give a context to our world as it being a, a, a 
new beginning process, then it becomes a new beginning process. So that's why it's important that we come into this experience with ourselves and unfold it. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop it right there. I'm a holy. I'm a cast each other through our children into this earth and just throw them to the wind. But what we're coming out of is a slumber where we are supposed to understand by our observance of each other and understanding of how we came here and what's involved with that, what type of effects we are supposed to bring and what type of things we need to undergird uh, potential weaknesses and things like that to help us move forward. And what you see is a tapestry of how we all come together. And we're going to do it on some participatory type stuff because we need to have that um, that's the laptop? Mm -hmm. Tight. Yo, you need to be on the laptop on, on, whenever somebody's teaching one of us need to be on the internet, man. You know? On that research mode from, from this point on. So that's what we're going to, we're going to get into that. Well, we have wireless in the house. Yeah. yeah, we need to be on that wireless. So you just you bring laptop if you have one. Okay. Uh, where we need to be all laptop laptop out in here. Uh -huh. right. All laptop out. Um, I'm going to take it and switch the whole gears a little bit too. Because I want us to be again to start to talk about whatever we feel concerning things about our life. See if we can map some things out in here. Okay? So be prepared to engage it on that level. Because um, I was thinking about it, and I'm going to tell you all something. I've been studying a particular segment of understanding self and people for 10 years that I have been completely reluctant to uh, uh, introduce because of my background, you know? And even though I'm in here, it's still in me, man. It's like I'm still, like, I'd be scared to say the words. Yeah, you know, I'd be scared. But you know, I, you know, the creator put this, the creator keep vibrating this in me, and he keeps saying, Jamel, this is the year of the heretic. You know what I mean? This is the year of the heretic. Because the Messiah always manifests as a heretic. Until the persons or people carrying it are dead, then it becomes acceptable. So someone has to carry it, <laughs> you know, now, and, and go ahead and bridge it, because we're not in the time of people being crucified anymore, you know? So we're, we're not in the time of martyrs, so I don't got nothing to worry about. So I need to throw that out. That day is gone. So I'm going to really get in on some things and try to connect it to this process, help people also find patterns. And I'm going to deal with it from the, the single perspective, the relationship perspective, the married perspective. And uh, if people want to even give examples of things, I want to show them how the forces connect connected them. Okay? How the forces connect them and how they can amplify it. With um, where they're at. All right. Um, any other questions or thoughts on uh, anything for tonight? All right. Okay. Um, you gonna put the website up on the camera and everything? All right. Cool. Cool. Excellent. All right, everybody in the virtual world and the physical world. That's something you can watch now. Yeah, it's um streaming being recorded live. and streaming live. Okay, cool. Okay. cool. Awesome. Watch okay. Watch. So everybody in the virtual world, <laughs> come back on Saturday <laughs> and uh, next Wednesday and, and so on and so forth. Maybe again in a week. Take notes. <laughs> oh.